Okay, hi everyone, and I think this is the sixth lecture, actually it says lecture five, of uh, Biomaterials One. Um, we're going to be talking about the foreign body response to biomaterials. So this is an extremely important topic that is also the subject of, it could be an entire course in itself, and we're going to be talking about it in a lot more detail in the second term of this course. So this is intended to be an overview and an introduction, and then we'll go into all the specific details in the next term. So just to get started on some definitions, because um, I think a lot of times when people talk about the foreign body response, they can throw out definitions assuming that you know what they are, and that can be kind of frustrating. So I will try to define everything as we go. Um, and if you guys, if there's something that's not clear, feel free to stop me. Okay, so the inflammatory response is just the reaction of inflammatory cells of the immune system and the surrounding tissue to an injury. Um, immunogenicity is the propensity to elicit a response from the immune system, whether it's innate immunity or adaptive immunity. Um, so when people say you know, they want to, that a biomaterial is immunogenic, that just means that it elicits an inflammatory response. Of course, all biomaterials elicit an inflammatory response, so it is extremely misleading and vague to say that a biomaterial is immunogenic without getting into more detail. Um, similarly, using the term biocompatible, that's, that's probably the most incorrectly used term that has ever existed in biomaterials. Um, People just throw it out there about every biomaterial to say that's why they decided to work on the biomaterial. But it has a very, it has a strict definition which is stable healing without significant ongoing inflammation or irritation. So all biomaterials will elicit an inflammatory response, but what you're looking for is the stabilization of this over time and integration with the body without a, without, you know, a persistent um, problem. Okay, and then there's innate versus adaptive immunity. I think that um, this is, I'm, I'm just going to go into this very briefly since all we'll be talking about today is basically innate immunity, and then next term we'll talk more about adaptive. So um, basi basically in innate immunity you have um, within hours to weeks you have cells of the innate immune system coming in. So what that means is that Everyone is born with an innate immune system, and then over time, you'll develop antibodies to infections that you encountered earlier in life, and then and that's why you have an acquired immune system. So you've heard of that, and um, as so that's why if you have an infection later in life, you have you mount a better immune response to it because your in your um, adaptive immunity has a memory a memory aspect to it, where it can amplify antibodies to a, an infection that you encountered earlier in life. So um, basically, the innate immunity um, constitutes the it's cells that initially contact any injury that you have. So if you have a foreign body, like a microbe or a biomaterial, macrophages come in um, and other phagocytes and initiate complement and um, the wound healing process and then they might present some, uh, they might communicate with B cells and T cells which then can come in and, and uh, that they will respond differently depending on what has happened earlier in your life. So the B cells and the T cells are, are what we are not going to be talking about today, but they basically produce antibodies or they um, help other cells that are affect their T cells to clear out an infection or something. Um, so another way to think about that is that a macrophage or a dendritic cell, which are both just types of um, inflammatory cells that are part of innate immunity, um, in response to an injury or a microbe or the implantation of a foreign body, they'll come in and they'll produce different cytokines um, in response to these foreign invaders, and then they go and they present um, like proteins on their surfaces called antigens to those cells of the adaptive immunity system like B cells and T cells. And then those, and then whatever the B cells and the T cells do, that's part of adaptive immunity. So some more definitions. A lot of times you hear people say white blood cells and that's kind of the way that they dumb down speaking about cells of the immune system to lay people. Um, so white blood cells, the actual technical term for them is leukocytes. And leukocytes can, uh, consist of all of these different types of cells that all have different functions, and they also can, they also include lymphocytes. So a lot of times people confuse leukocytes and lymphocytes. Basically, leukocytes are all white blood cells, including neutrophils, monocytes, macrophages. Lymphocytes are specifically B cells and T cells. So lymphocytes are a subset of leukocytes. Okay. So 
a good way to divide cells of the immune system, so a good way to divide leukocytes is in, is in lymphocytes, which is B cells and T cells, um, and also natural killer cells. Um, so those are lymphocytes that are, they recognize antigens that are on the surface of other cells of the, of like the innate system, like macrophages. Um, and then they'll use antibodies or other mechanisms to go in um, and clear out a foreign infection or something. Uh, so lymphocytes are a good way to characterize some of leukocytes. Others are antigen-presenting cells, like dendritic cells, macrophages, um, and they actually have, an anti they have antigens on their surface, excuse me, that they go and then literally present to a T cell or a B cell and changes the function of, the D of, the, of that lymphocyte. So they're called antigen-presenting because based on what they are responding to in the environment, they change their antigens on their surface, and then they go and interact with uh, those uh, cells of the adaptive immune response. And then effector cells um, can be either a lymphocyte or an antigen-presenting cell, but they're basically just the ones that do stuff, and that's why they're called effector cells. So macrophages will actually come in and, um, and clear the area of debris, or they'll, they'll phagocytize any microbes that are invading. Um, and T cells will do the same thing, especially cytotoxic T cells. Um, but we are going to get into lymphocytes and what B cells and T cells do specifically a lot more in the next term. So right now I want to get into um, wound healing, which is just basically innate immunity that we're talking about here. Um, so wound healing in a normal sense, so if you get a cut or an injury in any tissue in your body, it will undergo two stages of wound healing. The first is inflammation, which is a normal part of wound healing, and the second is the repair phase, um, which, it, which includes, which you can break down into cellular invasion remodeling and scar formation. So basically, as soon as you have an injury that's um, inflicted on a tissue, you have inflammation, and, that, and damage to the blood vessels is actually what triggers the inflammatory cascade and which, what triggers um, wound healing, the, the whole process to, to begin. So um, as soon as you have that damage, a fibrous clot forms immediately from blood because platelets aggregate and secrete fibrinogen, um, which clots in the presence of thrombin. Um, and that's actually a provisional matrix that provides a structure that cells can go through and use to um, to like secrete things in the in a uh, it just gives them something to use as a provisional matrix and that eventually goes away. But it also provides biochemical cues because it contains various chemoattractants and cytokines and growth factors that also facilitate healing. So it has a biochemical and a structural aspect to it. Um, and then local capillaries will dilate um, because of some of the cytokines that were released from inflammatory cells, and that increases the amount of blood that's getting to the area. Um, and that just helps in the whole wound healing process. So that's the inflammatory stage, um, briefly. The remodeling stage, you'll see proliferation, you'll see granulation tissue, um, and that's when you have proliferating fibroblasts laying down proteoglycans and collagen, and you also have some angiogenesis, um, and that actually depends on a lot of things, but you basically have angiogenesis here. Um, there's inflammatory, inflammatory cells like the macrophage inside of uh, this tissue. So when you implant a biomaterial into the body, you also have the inflammatory response, and it also triggers the whole process of wound healing. Um, so it's really helpful to use wound healing ideas to look at what happens with the biomaterial. But some things are different. Um, so basically, when you implant a biomaterial, just by nature of doing the surgery, you create an injury. And that breaks the blood vessels, and you have the same thing that happens in normal inflammation, that cells that are there release what are actually called danger signals and alarmins. Um, so they release them, it goes into the circulation and recruits other cells, such as more inflammatory cells and also stem cells that are home to the site of injury based on, chemo, based on concentration gradients of those cytokines. Um, but the first cells that come into play are uh, neutrophils and monocytes, and they come within hours of an injury. So how does that work? Um, it's pretty well understood, but still an active area of research, that um, leukocytes, especially neutrophils and monocytes, will, um, will so basically macrophages can exist in a tissue, and as soon as a damage happens, the macrophages that are there and also any damaged tissue start releasing cytokines that activate endothelial cells in the adjacent blood vessels to make them 
more likely to accept um, leukocytes that are traveling and that, that are just normally circulating to come into the site of injury. So things they'll do is upregulate specific um, integrin or specific receptors for integrins that allow the cells to bind to them, and they actually roll along the blood vessels and, and go into the site of injury. So you, you may have heard of leukocyte rolling and migration through an endothelial barrier, like across an endothelial layer into the tissue. Um, so that's how injury recruits um, neutrophils and macrophages. And then once they're there, those cells, especially the macrophages, will secrete the, the provisional fibrin matrix um, and start to try to degrade the material because the macrophages' role is that they recognize a foreign body and whether it's a microbe or an actual material, a biomaterial, and they'll attempt to degrade it. Um, if they cannot degrade it, uh, they may fuse into a multinucleated foreign body giant cell and isolate the material in a, in a fibrous capsule that literally walls off the biomaterial from the rest of the body, which serves to protect the body from this foreign material. So if, uh, if something happened, you know, if you got um, an arrow shot into your body, um, and then you broke off the, you know, you broke off the shaft, and then you would have an arrowhead stuck in your skin, and your body might wall it off in a fibrous capsule to protect you from anything that's happening there, like corrosion. And they also try to degrade it so that it can get, it will be, um, it will no longer be stuck in your body. So um, that's what the macrophages try to do. Um, Obviously, we don't want that to happen for a biomaterial because if it's encapsulated in a fibrous capsule, then it's not going to be interacting with cells the way that we designed it to. Um, so an extremely active area of research is how properties of the biomaterial affect the formation of the fibrous capsule. The, the goal is to have no fibrous capsule because you want the biomaterial to be completely integrated the way that you designed it to be. Um, so. It's really not known what about the biomaterial causes the, a thick or a thin fibrous capsule. But interestingly, you can use the thickness of the fibrous capsule to sort of estimate the severity of the immune response. So the thinner the fibrous capsule, the better um, integrated the, the biomaterial will be. And I would think of that as a more biocompatible material. Um, to summarize a little bit so far, when you have an injury that's caused for any reason, but if you have a biomaterial that is part of the injury, some of the, some of the processes that happen are biomaterial independent. They would happen even if it was just a normal injury, like a cut, and some of them are dependent of, on a biomaterial. So I think the schematic sort of illustrates it a little bit um, in a little different way, so that's why I put it here. Um, if you have a normal wound healing, you have platelet aggregation and formation of a fibrin clot, um, and you also have activation of the surrounding tissue to recruit more inflammatory cells like neutrophils and monocytes. Um, they release cytokines, and that controls the wound healing process. Um, and then on the right of this figure, you'll see that fibrinogen and these other two proteins called IgG and C3B um, are involved in directing the next cascade. Um, so fibrinogen, we learned last week, that, um, that binds with two different biomaterials with different affinities. And because fibrinogen activates a lot of inflammatory cells, you can see how that would be obviously something that would affect the inflammatory cascade. Um, but the, those proteins that we mentioned there, um, that, they are major proteins that are involved in opsonization of biomaterials. So they're actually called opsonins which is just a protein that coats the bi a biomaterial when, um, when you implant it. So IgG and C3B are, some of, are two of the most common proteins that will ab absorb to the surface of a biomaterial, and it's just because they're really abundant in, um, in the blood and in tissue. And then macrophages and neutrophils actually specifically um, react to IgG and C3B. So C3B is part of the, uh, well they're both part of the complement pathway that we're going to talk about in a lot more detail in the next term, um, but suffice it to say now that this protein coding step, this optimization, is an important part of the pathway. Um, so put differently, this is showing what happens if you have a small particle um, that becomes, it's fine, so it's, you know, maybe 100, 100 microns or something. Um, 
well, actually, I guess it would, this would probably be more likely that it's 100 nanometers. Um, it's coated in, but the body realizes that it's foreign because it becomes coated in opsonins just naturally because of the, the laws that govern protein absorption that we talked about last week. Um, and then they attempt to phagocytose the biomaterial. So they basically come around, pull it in, um, pull the fire material into the cell. So this is a macrophage we're talking about. And then they start releasing enzymes with it that degrade the material. Um, and so that's actually a picture on the right of a macrophage. Actually, that's an amoeba. But the same thing happens with macrophages, that it actually engulfs a particle. Um, you know, just a full disclosure there, that's not a macrophage, that's amoeba. Um, but I wanted to go over this briefly because a good way to think about what happens in fibrous capsule formation is that it's frustrated phagocytosis. So if a macrophage comes in contact with an opsonized biomaterial, maybe it wants to phagocytose it, but it's a big implant, so it can't phagocytose it because it's a little cell. Um, and so for reasons that is extremely poorly understood, the macrophages will fuse into foreign body giant cells that may have over a hundred nuclei. It's a multi it becomes, it becomes one cell with many nuclei, um, and it encapsulates the biomaterial in a fibrous capsule, um, which we, I showed schematically earlier. So some of the things that might affect that, um, what would, you know, the fibrous capsule formation are the size of the biomaterial, because if it can phagocytose a, a nanoparticle, it will, but if it's a big biomaterial, it can't. Um, degradability, because if it can degrade the material really easily, then it will do that. And if it can't, it'll probably fuse into a fibrous capsule. Um, protein adhesiveness, because cells need to bind to proteins. They can't bind to something that is, they don't have a receptor for. So um, there needs to be some proteins there for, their, for them to bind to. So those are some obvious things that would, uh, that would affect it. And we're going to talk a little bit more about other things that might. Um, but so the macrophage is probably the most important type of inflammatory cells for dictating the um, res dictating the course of wound healing and biomaterial um, acceptance or rejection and the formation of the fibrous capsule. Um, I'm not going to go into their specific behavior too much. Um, because it's extremely complicated, and it's only we're only beginning to understand to understand it. Um, it's actually the focus of my research right now, so I really appreciate the complexity of the macrophage and its behavior in response to a biomaterial. But you might read an article that says that the number of macrophages increased in a certain situation, and they make some conclusion based on that. But I really caution against making any conclusions about the number of macrophages without knowing the phenotype of the macrophages. It was just discovered in the last 10 or 15 years that macrophages can exist as an extremely inflammatory phenotype that just degrades things and causes inflammation, um, and, or it can be a pro-healing phenotype that actually promotes healing. So we're going to talk about that in more detail in the next term, but I just wanted to say this now so that, um, so that you understand that they're important, but also you should be careful about making any conclusions about the number of macrophages. Um, but macrophages are really important, and there's different types in different areas of the body. I think just because they were discovered at, by completely different people at different times. Otherwise, they all would have been called macrophage. Um, but I want to point out, so sites of injury and those from the bone marrow are um, inflammatory macrophages. Must have forgotten to put a schematic in here about what a macrophage actually is. Um, so I'll just say it. Basically, um, the bone marrow contains hematopoietic stem cells, and they differentiate into monocytes. And monocytes are one of the leukocytes that we were talking about here, and they home to the site of injury. Um, and monocytes differentiate into macrophages in tissues at the site of injury. So macrophages are derived from monocytes, which are derived from hematopoietic stem cells in the bone marrow. So these monocytes, when you're, when you're first developing as a fetus, the monocytes leave the bone marrow and they go and stay in tissues as resident tissue macrophages for your lifetime. Or they stay in the bone marrow and then they're released by calls from, from um, cells that, are, uh, that have been injured and then they home to the site of injury. So it's not to say that they're different types of macrophages, um, but yeah, I guess maybe they are different types of macrophages, and it's not, it's not really well known why they're different or how they're different. Um, but 
So inflammatory macrophages are, are what you think of as like the circulating ones, and there's also resident tissue mac macrophages that live in all the tissues in your body. And some of them have special names, like macrophages of the nervous system are microglial cells, um, and they're, they're separated from the rest of the body by the blood-brain barrier, so that's why they're their own type. Um, osteoclasts are actually macrophages, so you may have learned about them degrading um, bone. Those are actually just bone macrophages. Um, there's Kupfer cells in the liver, alveolar, alveolar macrophages in the lung, um, Langerhans cells in the skin. So these are all macrophages that behave extremely similarly, but we're only um, understanding recently how similarly. I keep alluding to the fact that they can exist on different phenotypes, and we're still confirming that that's true for all of these different types of macrophages. So it's really interesting. Um, but earlier in this term, we talked about how in an orthopedic implant that You'll, you might see um, wear particles being generated after 10 years of articulation of the, of the artificial joint. So, for example, metal or polyethylene will both have wear particles that form. And what actually happens is those wear particles, which are, which are little foreign bodies, they activate macrophages in the bone, osteoclasts. Um, they activate them to be extremely pro-inflammatory, and they make them start degrading everything in sight because activated macrophages degrade things. So that's why, so they even degrade the bone and that's why you see implant loosening when after wear particles. So it's actually not failure of the material when you have osteolysis in orthopedic implants. It's actually the macrophages going haywire on the own bone and degrading your, your own bone. So um, an interesting strategy for, for improving a um, an orthopedic implant might be to try to control the behavior of those osteoclasts. If you can stop the osteoclasts from degrading the bone, you won't have osteolysis. Okay, but moving on. Um, what happens with frustrated phagocytosis, if the macrophages, uh, I probably am going to be anthropomorphizing macrophages in this entire presentation, but if the macrophages are not happy, <laughs> they get frustrated and they will, what will happen is chronic inflammation. Um, what you can see in this diagram is a biomaterial, so right here, this is a biomaterial, it's um, PTFE, which is a really common biomaterial that helped, uh, helped um, learn a lot of things about fibrous capsule formation. Um, it's polytetrafluoroethylene, and you can see, and this is the inflammatory cells forming a capsule around it. Or actually, in this case, they're just um, they're just immediately responding to the t to the fire material being there. And this is zoomed in. All of these nuclei here are the inflammatory cells that immediately rush to the site of the biomaterial and started co started basically forming layers. Um, like this whole thing is just a huge layer of um, inflammatory cells, probably mostly macrophages and neutrophils, um, but the neutrophils only hang out for maybe 12 hours and then it's macrophages that dictate it at that point. So eventually these cells may fuse into a, foreign, into a giant cell or into several giant cells um, and then they'll eventually die leaving behind this fibrous capsule that's just fibrous collagen surrounding a biomaterial. So here we have a biomaterial here and this whole piece of tissue right there is the fibers capsule. And that can be five microns to 200 microns, depending on basically how immunogenic the biomaterial is, basically how offensive it is to the surrounding tissues and the, and the macrophages mostly. So I keep saying not a lot is known about fibers capsule formation, but um, what is known is that Monocytes that are circulating come to the biomaterial and they enter the site of injury. They, they go to the biomaterial and they differentiate into macrophages. Macrophages that are already present are probably also involved, but it's really difficult to differentiate between who just arrived and who was already there. Um, and at some point, they will fuse into this foreign body giant cell or many cells that have multiple nuclei. We don't really know why this happens, but we know that there are some cytokines that are definitely involved, and they are IL-4 and IL-13. Um, we know that they're involved because if you like knock that out of a, of a mouse, if you make a genetic mutant, you won't have this, this kind of fibrous capsule formation. Um, but I want to caution that 
these cytokines, IL-4 and IL-13, are also involved in a lot of other processes, so you can't just say that those are like bad for biomaterial integration because it's really not known um, if that's the case. They, all interleukins have a whole lot of, um, have a whole host of functions. Actually, the, because the inflammatory response is so important for all wound healing and, and, and any disease and anything that you have, um, you want to be really careful in making any generalizations about what in, if, about inflammatory cytokines and how they affect um, anything. <laughs> so, but we do know that fibrous capsule formation requires IL-4 and IL-13. So, more about the fibrous capsule. Um, within the fibrous capsule, you have lysosomal enzymes secreted by the macrophages that form it in an attempt to degrade the biomaterial. And they will, if the biomaterial is able to be degraded by these lysosomes, um, by these lysosomal enzymes, then it'll eventually become degraded. Um, so a lot of times you hear about like PLGA, for example, is a biodegradable polymer. It degrades by hydrolysis in, in aqueous solutions. And so maybe it takes, maybe if you put a piece of PLGA in a jar of PBS or water, it'll take six weeks for it to completely degrade. In the body, it might only take one week because the macrophages will completely degrade it with all these crazy harsh enzymes and um, and then it'll go away. And then once the once they are successful in degrading the uh, biomaterial, the capsule will collapse into a scar, and then that'll probably be remodeled and, and gotten rid of. Maybe if it was huge, you might have some residual scar that never goes away. But um, the biomaterial is pretty good at, or the body is pretty good at clearing um, the fibrous capsule once they get rid of the foreign object. Um, but I'm, I'm spending this entire lecture talking about the fibrous capsule because it is probably the most important, um, it's one of the most important things that we need to think about when we're talking about the inflammatory response to biomaterials because it can completely prevent interactions between your biomaterial and the rest of the body. Um, it's one of the biggest reasons why sensors fail um, and it's also critical for any material that should be integrated with the, with the body, which is you know, pretty much most biomaterials. Um, as an example, biosensors need to take information from tissue or blood and then transmit that information to a computer and give you some sort of readout. So this is an example of like a glucose sensor. Um, so in diabetic patients, they need to have a good understanding of what their glucose levels are. Um, and so if the sensor becomes completely encapsulated by a, a fibrous capsule and enzymes that try to degrade it, it will obviously stop being functional. Um, so a really, so this is, the, the formation of the fibrous capsule has really, I think, stopped the field of biosensors from moving forward as quickly as it could because we just haven't figured out too well yet how to stop the fibrous capsule formation. So um, it pretty much occurs around all foreign materials, whether you like it or not. Um, and the thickness can be used as a measure of the severity of the immune response. So that's great because a lot of the research that we've been able to do has been using just the thickness of the fibrous capsule that forms as a measure of whether or not you've been able to um, modulate the inflammatory response. Um, some biomaterials are not encapsulated, um, and, they, and if they're not encapsulated, they'll become integrated and vascularized. So, to any biomaterial that um, does that does become integrated is pretty much like a tissue engineering strategy. So tissue engineering is the idea of growing new tissues in the body using some biomaterial structure, um, and they those that can actively participate with surrounding cells. So usually you hear about them in the tissue engineering and regenerative medicine field. They're a lot more successful than biomaterials that are designed by people that have no understanding of tissue engineering. So I think that um, biomaterials engineers should really look into the tissue engineering field to understand why, or to be able to, be able to apply some of those um, strategies to, to regular biomaterials that aren't intended to engineer any tissue. Um, so there's a lot, I'm gonna go through some of the properties of biomaterials that are known to affect the inflammatory response. Um, but this is an extremely complex topic that has a lot of active research right now. So um, you can't really make too many generalizations because whenever you're comparing, so let's say you, you do something and then you, uh, you have a biomaterial and you modify it to see how it tests the inflammatory response, you're gonna compare back to that unmodified material which has its own inflammatory response. 
So it's difficult to make any conclusions because your control is not a control. Everything has some inflammatory response depending on the properties of the biomaterial. So you always, whenever you're analyzing studies that say something about the inflammatory response, you have to say what is it comparing back to. Um, so for example, protein absorption, we talked a lot about last week. Um, so that is a reason why the surface of the biomaterial can, can be used to control the inflammatory response, because if you can use the surface to control protein absorption and then that controls the inflammatory response, then that's a good way to interact. That's a good way to control the inflammatory response. Um, for a long time, engineers have tried to improve the biocompatibility by just coating materials with PEG or some protein that would make it difficult for a pro or some polymer that would make it difficult for the for the uh, for any proteins to absorb and then therefore for cells to attach. And that is true that proteins don't absorb as well like we talked about last week, but they're still encapsulated in a fibrous capsule. Um, so the macrophages are still inter interacting with the material. Um, they absolutely have frustrated phagocytosis and they have a thick fibrous capsule. So um, that is definitely not the way to improve the biocompatibility of something, unless you don't want there to be um, cell interactions um, because they're going to get encapsulated in fibrosis. Um, so some other ways that of course are going to affect um, the inflammatory spots are the chemical activity of the material. So especially if it's, um, you know, susceptible to corrosion or to degradation, anything that they release as a byproduct of the corrosion or the degradation is also going to elicit an inflammatory response in addition to the biomaterial itself. Um, something that is often not really considered is the shape of an implant will affect the inflammatory response. This is not really known why, but we do know that if you have a square biomaterial that you implant, you'll have a thicker fibrous capsule at the corners where stress is concentrated. Um, so it's not really not, sh it's just, there's just not a lot known about what the macrophages are actually doing in response to different biomaterials. So it's kind of an exciting time right now to be studying this because so little is known. Um, and then motion between an implant and tissue, you'll see fibrous capsules forming there, um, even if the material, if there was no motion, if the material would have been fine. So it's really, so that's something to think about. Um, okay, so. In general, materials that are closer to the native body will be more favorable to the immune response, so they'll be more biocompatible. And that makes sense because maybe they wouldn't be recognized as being as foreign as a different foreign body that's like, you know, titanium. So for example, um, something that really helps in um, trying to make the immune response a little bit more favorable for biomaterials is coding with ECM proteins, extracellular matrix proteins. So this is an example of um, titanium rods that were, um, the surface was coated with a collagen um, chondroitin sulfate mixture. Um, and so what we're seeing here is in the first panel you have, so you have non-coated titanium here, and these are all macrophages being, well osteoclasts, because this was implanted in bone, um, being stained red, um, and you see when it's coated in collagen and CS, you can see actually more osteoclasts, which might be counterintuitive, but that's why I said you can't think about the number of macrophages as being indicative of anything, because in this case, the authors say that it's indicating better remodeling, because more osteoclasts are there. But you could also read about the argument being that more macrophages lead to a thicker fibrous capsule, which will happen. If you have more macrophages, it will be a thicker fibrous capsule, unless it's a favorable interaction. So it depends on the phenotype of the macrophage, and that's why the number means nothing. Um, but if you look at the fibrous capsule, I think this is after a couple weeks. Um, on the unmodified titanium surface, you see a fibrous capsule that's um, it's pretty, I mean, it's not, I don't know how thick it is, there's no scale bars on here, but it's there. And then the five, the, what's surrounding this coated titanium rod is actually bone, and it probably has a couple, maybe a couple cells thick of a small fibrous capsule that the authors don't point out because it's, it's not visible in this image, but I assume it's probably there. Um, so the collagen CS, the collagen chondroitin sulfate coating, reduced the size of the fibrous capsule. And then after some time where they allowed new bone formation to occur, now this is completely sound, surrounded by fibrous tissue. It's all just, it's all just collagen fibers surrounding it. Um, this is a trichrome stain, which, which stains for um, newly forming, well, which stains for collagen tissue, but I guess that this one is more, maybe it's not as uh, 
not as stained by the trichrome. Um, but so you see a lot of new bone formation happening in the, in the implants that were coated with collagen and CS. So this is an example about how an, a favorable inflammatory response would be more favorable for wound healing as well. So in this case, the healing was in bone, and so the body responded by producing more bone. So you can see how the fibrous capsule leads to a change in, um, in the acceptance of, of the biomaterial and the success of the biomaterial. So some other ways that are used to, that have been studied for affecting the inflammatory response um, are pretty much what we talked about last week with different ways of modifying surfaces. They've all sort of been, they're starting to be tested. Um, so surface chemistry, if you change the functional groups that you have on the surface of a biomaterial, that's going to affect protein absorption, which will then affect the inflammatory response. Um, there's been studies of surface topography, you know, if you put on a, you know, nano, nano structures or, or um, pits into the surface that's going to affect cell adhesion and that will also affect um, inflammatory cell adhesion and also what they do in response to the biomaterial. Um, more specifically, if, I mean, if you want to have a more specific response, you can, you can conjugate specific peptides to the surface of a biomaterial to direct the response. Um, we are not it's not really known yet what peptides would be good for um, a certain biomaterial or for a certain inflammatory response. I think right now what's all that's been shown is that if you have peptides, it seems if they're tethered to the surface of biomaterial, it's sort of like an ECM coating and that it's just more natural and so you'll have reduced fibrous capsule thickening, but there hasn't been any like directed control of the inflammatory cell yet. Um, and the same thing with the anti-inflammatory mediators. Um, an anti-inflammatory mediator, you can, it might reduce the thickness of the fibrous capsule if we know what it does, um, if you pick the right anti-inflammatory mediator, um, and also some growth factors, but that this is all still in the, in the research phase and we can't really say too many conclusions about it yet. Um, but basically the pharmaceuticals we'll talk more about in the next term when we're going to talk about drug delivery and the foreign body response. Um, but so just some examples about how um, how some, some certain properties of biomaterials will affect the inflammatory response. So in most of these, we're going to be talking about fibrous capsule thickness as a measure of the inflammatory response. So this was, I think this was PTFE again, um, discs, but I'm not sure, um, that they changed the surface chemistry using some of the techniques that we talked about last week that you can do. Um, so they had methyl groups on there, um, fluoride groups, hydroxyl groups, amine, or carbo carboxylic acid. And the histology on the right, um, these red lines denote where the biomaterial stops and the fibrous capsule begins. Um, so on, this, on the right side you have the biomaterial and on the left side fibrous capsule. And so you can see the thickest fibrous capsule was formed in this experiment um, on, the hydrogel, or on the materials that were coated with hydroxyl groups. So that is actually being confirmed a lot, and that's sort of what I was talking about with how you don't really want to coat a material with PEG because you just have a thick fibrous capsule. So of course it depends what you're comparing to. Some have shown uh, thinner fibrous capsules when you coat with PEG or with hydroxyl groups. Um, but this is a reason why you would have more fibrous capsule formation if you surround by hydroxyls. And that's because you have lower protein um, absorption and so the, the materials or the cells can't interact as well with the material and then they become more frustrated. So interaction is actually the way to go um, in, to, in order to reduce the fibrous capsule. But just like we saw a benefit uh, last week when we were talking about how you want to reduce protein absorption for like a catheter or something because you want it to be isolated from from the body, or maybe you want to pre prevent bi bacterial adhesion. Um, researchers have also exploited the fact that hydroxyl um, groups and hydrogels actually, they can actually be thought of as like immunoprotective in the sense that cells, can, since they can't adhere to them as much, um, they won't be able to degrade them. So I guess, I guess they just prevent interaction. Um, if you have a more hydrophilic surface, it prevents interaction. Um, so this has been used for a really cool application, which is a transplantation of pancreatic islet, islets, which are the cells in the pancreas that produce insulin. So for diabetic patients, it's been um, explored that they actually encapsulate like healthy insulin-producing pancreatic islet cells from a donor. They encapsulate them in a peg hydrogel, in peg hydrogel beads, and then implant them into a diabetic patient. 
and the insulin can get out, and glucose can get in, so the pancreatic islet cells can respond to low, to a higher low glucose, um, and then they can secrete insulin, and the insulin can diffuse out because these are small molecules diffusing um, through a, a hydrogel. But um, the inflammatory cells cannot get in, so they don't recognize these foreign cells as being a foreign cell that they need to degrade, um, and so then they don't produce antibodies because they're not producing, they're not doing any antigen presentation. So this is a really cool way to transplant functional cells that never interact with cells of the body. They just do what they were supposed to do based on insulin response. Okay, so in terms of how porosity of a, bi of a biomaterial might affect um, the inflammatory response or maybe even topography, so these are really small pores, again, on PTFE discs. So you might think of this as more of like a topographical change because since they're so small, you would think of it more as like a, you might put a porous coating onto a biomaterial, and this is the size of the pore that we're talking about. So um, this is a non-porous disc, or 1.2 microns, 3 microns, or 4.4 microns. This is the size of the pores. Um, and what it was actually found after implanting in a mouse is that the thickness of the capsule was a lot thinner for the porous materials compared to the non-porous. And I think that the, the two pore sizes in between were not statistically significant, which is why it's not shown on this graph. But you can see that um, the porosity, the, the presence of the porosity did decrease the capsule thickness. Maybe that was because there was better cell adhesion. Um, it's difficult to say. We, don't, we really don't know why macrophages respond differently because of pore size. We just are starting to see that it happens. Um, it's also been examined for large pores, so this is with non-porous P-hema-based hydrogels that were micro-templated so that they can have channels and also larger pores. Um, so 60 microns, 30 microns, and 20 microns. And this was a really cool study because what they found after, I think this is after six weeks or something of subcutaneous implantation, um, if you look at the graph of the capsule thickness, 30 microns and 20 microns have much thinner fibrous capsules than, first of all, a non-porous hydrogel or a 60 micron pores. So the reason why that's crazy is because we knew that fibrous capsules would form around these hydrogels because they're hydrophilic and that's frustrated phagocytosis and that's what happens. Um, you would think that the 60 micron pores might have a thinner fibrous capsule because the cells could go in it or something or they interact better, um, but that's not the case. It's thinner for 30 microns and 20 microns. Um, the other reason why that's really interesting is because they actually found in the same study that hydrogels that had 60 microns or 30 microns um, pore sizes had better vascularization than the 20 micron pore sizes. So the trend, so they, obviously they're not correlated, or they're, um, they're related. We know there's angiogenesis and fibrous capsule and the inflammatory response are all related, but clearly we don't know how since the, this study was able to uncouple the angiogenesis and the inflammatory response somehow. So um, based on this data, it would seem that the 30 micron pore size would be like the sweet spot of pore sizes that would result in optimal vascularization and the thinnest fibrous capsule. Of course, it's still 80 microns thick, so it's still not a good answer. It still didn't solve the problem of the fibrous capsule because that's still going to wall it off from the rest of the body. But um, if blood vessels could get in, that might indicate that over time, maybe the fibrous capsule would get thinner or something, um, and it would become more integrated because of the vasculature. So one study also found some really interesting results of the effects of macromolecular structure. So they had OPF hydrogels, which is oligopolyethylene glycol fumarate. So it's basically PEG, but it's degradable. But it's very similar to a PEG hydrogel. Of course, you have the fibrous capsule, um, just like you have with normal PEG hydrogels. Um, and there was no, the, the groups that are studied on the bottom, OPF, um, they, did, they tested one, two, and three. Those were, I can't remember what they, uh, what were the differences there about what, what were the difference between those groups, but they had no difference in fibrous capsule anyway. But the difference between those and the OPF81 that's shown on the right of both graphs here is that, that those hydrogels had a much lower cross-linking density because the molecular weight of the PEG used to cross-link those hydrogels was a lot bigger. So the lower cross-linking density actually allowed they, did, they said there was no difference in fibrous capsules, so that's interesting, but they found that there was more inflammatory cells and multinuclear cells that infiltrated the hydrogel. So they were actually able to go into the hydrogel, which is kind of surprising because normally we just see 
um, engulfment and fibrous capsule formation, but you don't really see the cells going into the hydrogel. So um, the fact that there were big pores, um, not you know not big compared to what we were just looking at, but big for a hydrogel, um, so maybe like. I don't know, 100 angstroms or something, um, and the cells were able to interact with, with the, uh, were able to infiltrate a little bit more. So maybe they were able to push around the polymer chains and get in there because cells do remodel by materials. So that was pretty interesting, um, still being studied. Okay, another, uh, something else you might want to do to control um, the inflammatory response is bioactivity and um, a surface coating that might make a material more bioactive. So these are pictures of titanium plates that are either left uncoated or coated with hydroxyapatite and a bioglass coating. And what we found here, so this is funny because they don't say the capsule thickness, they actually talk about quantity and quality and the quality of the interface which is like a really subjective term and it's funny that they, they sort of scored how, um, you know, the quality of the capsule, like it's a good thing. Um, but they did find that when they add this coating, it increased the quality of the capsule. I assume that means the thickness of the capsule was the same. Um, but you can, you know, maybe some more optimization of this material might result in a better integrated biomaterial, since we know bioglass integrates really well with bone. Um, degradation byproducts are um, something that you might not think about as being important for the inflammatory response, but um, but you know then once you once you think about it, of course it's kind of obvious that any any monomer or um, byproduct that's released is going to affect the macrophages and the inflammatory response in addition to the biomaterial itself. So this is an example of PLA-based networks, so they're basically cross-linked PLA networks. Um, and the fibrous capsule denoted here by FL as fibrous, fiber, fibrous layer is much thinner for the slower degrading material than for the faster degrading material at this time point because, and this, well maybe, it's, it's hard to really prove this, but at this time point, a lot more lactic acid would, was released and there was a thicker fibrous capsule maybe indicating a more severe immune response compared to this one that had less lactic acid released. So, that's actually not the conclusion that was reached in this paper, but that's what that's why I think that it happened. They said that it was just related to. Um, actually, I don't think they made a conclusion about why there was a difference in the fibrous capsule in this particular paper, um, which the reference I looks like I forgot to put on there, but I will look that up um, and put it and uh, send out an email or something. But. Uh, so you can, this is just an example about how the release of, a, of an acid byproduct would of course affect the inflammatory response. Okay, besides the biomaterial, you're gonna have other factors that, inf that could influence the inflammatory response, of course. Um, the site of implantation is a big one because there are areas that have greater access to the blood supply than others, and if there's greater access to the blood supply, you're gonna have greater inflammation. Um, there's also areas, because they have such a low access to the blood supply, they're sort of immune privileged, such as the cornea and cartilage. So you, can, you won't really get a fibrous capsule forming in cartilage because there's no blood there. So um, you, that doesn't really happen. Um, the implantation procedure will affect things because you want to do as little damage as possible. So that's just sort of, of course you would want to do that anyway, but more if it's a more complicated surgery that requires, you know, opening up, that requires severing a lot of tissues and stuff, that's going to definitely have a bigger inflammatory response. Um, and infection. Interestingly, if a biomaterial becomes infected, even if it's a small infection that maybe you're able to clear with systemic antibiotics, that changes the immune response to the biomaterial itself. And the biomaterial also changes the, the response of macrophages and of inflammatory cells to invading microbes. So they're definitely related. Um, and I think it's really just because the macrophage is in charge of, of uh, combating microbes and biomaterials. So um, of course they're going to affect each other. So that's something that is definitely important to think about. Um, so one thing that's interesting and exciting to think about is the concept of immunomodulatory biomaterials, which would be a biomaterial that specifically is directed towards the behavior of a particular type of inflammatory cell or immune cell. So this diagram is is, is being directed towards a dendritic cell. Um, 
which is actually really similar to a macrophage, but it's it's not a macrophage. Um, you can there's also biomaterials that are designed to affect the behavior of the macrophage itself, um, and that makes sense because if you can do some sort of if you can tether something to the surface of your biomaterial that interacts in a specific way with inflammatory cells to make them be more favorable toward your, toward your biomaterial, then that would seem like something we can do for all biomaterials, um, we're just doing a surface modification. So this is really exciting that, that we're starting to um, find out interesting things about that now. So the more we know about macrophages and why they respond to certain biomaterials and dendritic cells, um, we'll be able to hopefully control that behavior using specific, specific things tethered to the surface of biomaterials. So I mentioned this earlier, but um, strategies from regenerative medicine and tissue engineering should definitely be applied to biomaterials designed. Um, so biomaterials that can actively promote new tissue growth and that interact with cells that are surrounding them and that become vascularized, they might not be walled off on a fibrous capsule. So we should really look at anything that's not walled off on a fibrous capsule, we should be applying those strategies to all biomaterials. Um, and I sort of talked about this. Um, tissues that do not typically replicate um, commonly undergo fibrosis in a process similar to fibrous capsule formation. So uh, tissues that are permanent for your life, like cardiac tissue, nerves, and cartilage that don't typically repair, um, if you do have an injury, it'll probably result in a fibrous scar as opposed to actually healing the injury. So um, there might be some clues there about why some fibers, why fibrous capsules form in some instances and not in others. So looking into the biology of those tissues is, is a unique strategy that might be useful. Um, so one of many summary slides, basically the foreign body response is when you implant a biomaterial, which is the foreign body, um, as soon as that happens, you have acute inflammation because of the damage to the blood vessels, and that recruits neutrophils and monocytes, which then differentiate into macrophages. Um, and then, depending on the biomaterial and the macrophage interaction with the biomaterial, that affects the ensuing um, response in terms of if the fibrous capsule forms, how thick it is, whether or not the material can be degraded. Um, but chronic inflammation is basically when macrophages fuse, fuse into foreign body giant cells and wall off the material into a fibrous capsule. So the foreign body response is like normal wound healing in some ways in that it's completely controlled by the inflammatory response and that there's, you know, there's provisional fibrin matrices. Um, but the key differences are that the foreign body response is associated with unresolved acute inflammation events. So in normal wound healing, you have inflammation, and if without inflammation, you won't have normal wound healing. So it's definitely important, but it's resolved in normal wound healing, and it's not in the foreign body response. Um, so then that becomes chronic inflammation, characterized by the persistence of inflammatory cells that aren't supposed to hang around. They're supposed to direct wound healing and then go back to being quiescent or hanging out in the cell, in the tissues, um, so if they're still there and they fuse into a fibrous capsule, then that is characteristic. That's, you know, that's different from normal wound healing. Um, you typically have limited angiogenesis, um, but I don't really want to say that that's the case for all foreign body reactions because a lot, sometimes you could have excessive angiogenesis that's also bad. Um, so that's not, that's not necessarily a generalization. Excessive fibrosis is a generalization. You'll have more. That will definitely happen. That's the fibrous capsule formation. So that doesn't happen in normal wound healing, but it does happen in the foreign body reaction. And the foreign body reaction can be exacerbated by infection, um, properties of the biomaterial itself, and any shape or motion considerations of the implant. So in summary, Preventing the formation of the fibrous capsule is a goal that we have for all biomaterials um, so that we, the biomaterials can do what we intend them to do, which is to interact with the body and um, be a permanent fixture in the body that's accepted by the body. So there's a ton of research right now in materials and sur materials um, synthesis and surface modifications and coatings that are intended to direct the behavior of inflammatory cells in order to reduce the fibrous capsule and to increase um, into, to have better wound healing responses in biomaterials. So, that's that. Thank you.